A year ago, November, I captured this photograph at Seattle's Japanese Garden. One of the things I remember most vividly about that morning was not the beautiful light or the incredible stillness that I felt when I took the photograph. It said I spent most of the morning hiding from gardeners. <laughs> the Seattle Japanese Garden has this rule that you're not allowed to set your equipment down off of its paths. But even with the widest lens that my camera system offered, I could not fit all of a Vendosora into my frame. So the morning ended up being some sort of a weird mashup between hide and seek and the floor is lava, and there was me hiding my camera <laughs> behind a bush, and all of the arborists knew that I was the guy who was going to cheat. <laughs> I think they let me do it, though, because when the fog settled on the garden and it separated the tree from everything else, the light was just perfect. And I set my tripod down gingerly, a little bit off, out of bounds, and I captured a Vendosaura. And I remember coming back in bounds, setting my camera down, and looking at the back, and just thinking, damn, I'm going to miss this tree when it's gone. My name is Jason. I'm an artist, writer, entrepreneur, and probably the most unemployable person in the room. <laughs> One of the most difficult transitions that I've had to make was completing my master's program in organizational leadership and then discovering that nobody would hire me. So I went back to the drawing board and I spun the wheel of career options. And when that needle landed on that tiny sliver that said artist, I was skeptical. And honestly, I'm still unpacking a lot of what that means today. But people would come to me and they'd ask me, when did I become a photographer or how did I start this whole thing? And I feel like they're asking me two questions. If they're asking me, when did I pick up a camera? That was 2006, stationed in North Pole, Alaska, and I had taken up the great hobby of backcountry hiking alone, like every native New Yorker should do without any experience at all. <laughs> so I came back to base alive with stories of almost dying and bears and wolves. And there was always met with skepticism, so I bought a camera. And I never saw a wolf again. <laughs> But if you're asking when I chose art as a career, it was when HR and corporate recruiters would tell me that my worldly experiences were not real world experiences. And eventually I was. I just had to take their word for it. So I went from taking pictures to making photographs to creating art. And up until 2017, when I had captured that first photo of a Vendosora, I had been noticing that some of the most beautiful and intimate places that I've had the privilege and luxury to capture were disappearing. So people would come to me and they would say, that place is immortalized because you took this photograph, or that lives on forever because you clicked the shutter. But inside, there was always been this narrative that I would go back to these places, sans camera, and just experience them without that filter of that four pound block of technology in between me and the rest of the world. Instead, these are all now part of a collection that I call Beautiful Things That Are Gone. The first in the collection is a piece that I call Dance. And what you're looking at. Is the first rays of sunrise to come streaking over the headlands behind me and striking this singular tree on this singular monolith on Washington's Olympic coast? I waited eight hours to take this photograph. It lasted less than one second. This was New Year's Day, 2015. I spent New Year's Eve wandering the coastline. Shooting stars, looking for compositions, and warming myself excessively with box wine. <laughs> I spent the last three hours of that morning, or the first three hours of the morning, however you look at life, waiting for this moment to happen. And I'm so thankful that I did not turn away and I did not allow myself to be distracted. Because a year later, and with the growing power of the storms we've been experiencing, In the Northwest and around the world, this tree and monolith are gone. The next in the collection is a piece that I call Dance. 
This was one of those frigid winter mornings that just happened to happen on an inconvenient day in spring. And I was looking for two things in this tree grove. I was looking for chaos where you would expect order, and I was looking for isolation in what felt like a mob. So when I found this, this composition in the transition at night, I knew that I would sit there and shiver until the sun came up so I could get the shot. And when the sun did rise, the shadows moved so fluidly along the backs of these trees that it looked as if they were moving. So I named this piece Dance. This is what it feels like to find solitude in a big city. About 75% of this forest is gone. It's cut down and replaced with cattle and potatoes. So I went out there last month to see it for myself. And if there are any photographers watching this or in the audience, and you're looking for a challenge, try making a potato field interesting. <laughs> this was once endless fields of poplar trees. And they'd kick me off stage if I told you all the things I said to that cow <laughs> to get it to look at me. It's a tough business sometimes. <laughs> Tree of fire. Thinking of how beautiful this Japanese maple at Seattle's Kubota Garden was is always inspiring to me. I had long moments alone with the tree, and I wondered at its tenacity and its single-mindedness to always grow in one direction for decades while maintaining this balance over the pond, reaching for the sun. Following the sweeping lines of his branches is like moving through a labyrinth with your eyes. It's a moving meditation, and that's why these trees are so beautiful. Unfortunately, this tree, like everything else in this collection, is gone. Destroyed when a storm, again, knocked a much larger tree down, obliterating the site. This is what it looked like after the storm. Completely unrecognizable. Lastly, ice cave with a view. Another place in transition. This was one of the more surreal and crazy experiences that I've ever had. And it was surreal because I never knew such a place could be so immense. And it was crazy because everywhere around me was evidence that I could die in an avalanche at any moment. Now, you already know I'm a risk taker and a little bit of a rule breaker. And people tell me that if I continue taking risks, like this, that I'll end up being added to my own list. <laughs> I don't think I qualify. They'd have to change the title, but <laughs> it happens. But I was as safe as I could be during the winter of 2014, one of the warmest winters I've ever experienced in the Northwest. There's almost no snow. But there was a week-long span of sub-freezing temperatures before I managed to make it out to the cave. And in the back of the cave where there should have been ice, there was a 200-foot waterfall. And if you're looking for scale, that little red speck standing on that two-story block of ice is me. This place was immense. I spent three hours in the cave counting water drops as they fell from the ceiling and just hoping that they would only be water drops. And knowing that I was there at its 11th hour, I spent the last 40 minutes watching this unlikely light develop outside of its sweeping curves. The day after I was there, an avalanche trapped five people inside the cave. Thankfully, luckily, they were able to self-rescue, but caves like this have claimed many lives in the past as they melt. I find myself dreading the next addition to beautiful things that are gone. And it is odd to be simultaneously proud of and apprehensive of the same thing. And when I think on this, it reminds me of a likeness to my own life, where on one hand, I am afraid of and proud of this career of being an artist and everything that it entails. And on the other hand, I am afraid of becoming a temp worker, building boxes in a popcorn factory, again. <laughs> I really hope that boss sees the miss sometime. <laughs> but there's another lesson that I take from these and that I apply to life in general. And that is that the power and great change is in the shadow of what was lost. 
and that if you care for those memories and if you cherish them, they become meditations that fuel who you are and who you are becoming. Thank you.